So uh, you, you started AU in 2012. Yeah. As an undergrad, as I recall. And I think you only took my executive suite course. I correct? did, yes. And that's, that's where I learned the, the grueling process of uh, professional distribution and how t tumultuous it is and how crazy it is. You're going to give us education a little bit later. Definitely. On the indie, on the indie film side, you yeah, obviously right. got the big budget, you know, million, million dollar stuff, but I have the uh, <laughs> indie yeah, film they're, they're perspective. They're shark-infested warders wherever you look. Um, <laughs> but, but I met you before that because, because we, we, we talked on campus, I think, we used to stop by the office. Oh, tons of times. And, yeah, yeah. And, and, and we, you know, you, you had, I, I want to say you were already working on this when you came yeah 12 or, or yeah definitely i had i had like the pre-production all planned out because i was just i basically in each and every summer just because i had it in my brain that oh i'm not going to be successful if i graduate college and i don't have anything to show for it <laughs> that's yeah. just the, the mindset that i had which is it's a complete lie like it's always you always tell yourself lies just to try to i don't know like you, you know just try to motivate yourself sometimes um but anyway yeah it was um um, every single summer in between each um, year of school, every single summer, that's when I filmed The Brotherhood. Every single okay. summer. And, and it was made uh, like in between like maybe like, it was actually made totally like between four years. Um, <laughs> but yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. So because I knew that the individuals and the actors that I had, they had like, yeah, 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 deep price. That was crazy. Uh, because I knew that when I graduated, I like I had to like, OK, you got to get a job. You got to figure out how to pay the bills. You got to do this. and You're not going to have time to put 100 percent of your focus into your film. You know, that's just the mindset that I had. But now, you know, there are so many different avenues that you can still make that happen after after graduation. Um, but that's just the mindset that I had. So. Well, well, knowing that, uh, I, I mean, I, um, I must say that, that the one thing I liked about it, it had a consistent look mm. across all of it, knowing that it was shot, you know, for four different summers. And I saw my man, Wild Man Wyatt Eddie, uh, help you with some of the sound. Oh, actually, I have a really, really great story about Wyatt and, uh, and Prerna, actually. Um, okay. I introduced him to his soon-to-be wife on my movie. Okay. All right. Oh, all, okay. okay. Yes, okay. all my movies. So I actually connected them together. Okay. You're like because Prana is one of my, you know, one of my greatest friends. I've known her now for over nine years, um, <laughs> which is crazy to think of. But yeah, like as soon as as soon as she came in to you know to to, to do some ADR with um with Wyatt, you know, Prana was like, oh, hey, oh, oh he's cute. Let's go. To <laughs> So I was like, yeah, let me hook you guys up. And they're still married to this day. So that's wild for me to think right, about. I don't have to tease why. I mean, normally I would be seeing him on campus over at Cats in 135. But, of course, we were in this posture. So yeah. I, don't, I don't get But he's, he's a solid guy. I mean, just a solid human being. Wyatt is the greatest. He really is. <laughs> yeah, and very talented. His, his the group project that he turned in. The spring he took my sound design course is still one of the ones I use as an example. Oh wow! Of, of, of um, because in, in the in the sound design course, each group has the same picture cut to work with. Mm. So that way, when say your version goes up, we can hear where you put music and where you put sound design, and maybe you left this canvas blank here, and the other group put in an effect, and the other group did something different. But looking at the exact same picture cut. You can easily see how 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 much sound actually contributes to the psychology of mm -hmm. appreciating or not appreciating the picture cut. Right, this is the exact same picture cut. If I had four different picture cuts, then it's four different stories. I said, no, no, everybody has to do this. <laughs> same page. And, and and everybody's competing against each other, but in a sense, it's really it's just four different versions of how this story could be told sonically. Exactly. So, the majority of the students that you're looking at here got a chance to see the Brotherhood. A few of them didn't. So just kind of set us up with what's the premise uh, from a story point of view. We already know it took you like four summers to do it. Yeah. And then we'll get into. And much longer than that, because there's been more. There's like there's been break-ins to my car where they stole the whole damn movie. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. 
They stole the whole damn, the whole thing. Okay. And all my, and my, all my equipment. So, and I have all this in my slides too about like how to, how to cover your ASS, how to cover yourself, because there are people out there who, who will just, you know, they just, they just don't care. Um, no, come on, man. No, nobody, there aren't any thieves and, and ne'er do wells out here. So I, I, just, made, I just made you a co host. So nice. Share your screen. Yeah. Okay. Um, well. well so, so first off, uh, the, the Brotherhood is essentially a film about um, a boy and his brothers, right? A man and his brothers. And essentially, there's this hidden organization within the government called the Brotherhood that trains kids to become assassins, and trains them to do things that they don't necessarily want to do. So it's kind of like an indoctrination. Um, but the through line, the theme, is essentially Aiden trying to figure out what is the best way that he should steer his family. Should he stay in the Brotherhood or should he try to leave? Obviously, there are risks on both sides, but, you know, and he eventually at the end sees the consequences of, of not making a decision <laughs> or making the wrong decision. Um, he, he sees those that there are consequences to his actions. And that was uh, the thematic premise, if you will, or the controlling idea of what uh, Robert McKee would say, the controlling idea, essentially, the lesson learned, is that okay. you better make a choice and be able to live with that choice and know that there are repercussions for every, every, ch every outcome that you, every choice that you make, essentially. Um, and that was like the kind of like deeper, deeper meaning if you guys were, <laughs> were, were watching, I was like, you know, like each and every, you know, everything that you do comes with risk and, you know, so that was, that was what I tried to bake in there to give it some more, you know, substance. Because at first I wanted to make, I'm, I want to make something look cool, I want a lot of action, I want things blowing up and I want people to get shot. I just want to make a nice fun action movie. Okay. <laughs> and then after that, I started to look at you know, this guy, Robert McKee, right. and I started to look at, um, you know, people like, you know, Blake Snyder, who, you know, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of, you know, and um, also story by Robert McKee, and, yo, the, 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 they kind of, <laughs> kind of switched my brain on more of a, more of a kind of, you know, sub, subtext kind of level, so like, what is your movie really trying to say, like, what's actually going to make audiences latch on to it? Um, so yeah, I'm gonna, let's get started on, so, okay, so I'm a co-host right now, so. so you green button that says share screen. In front of oh, gotcha, okay. Okay. So let's see, yeah, share screen, um, so You have to pick either desktop or PowerPoint, or, I think if you pick the desktop, anything that's on there, you can maneuver in such a way that it becomes the center of what you're showing us. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to try to do a part of, I wish I could just do the, the PowerPoint. Hmm. Okay, um, you could do that. Um, is, is it already open on your desktop? Yeah, it is open. Mm -hmm. And then it, the, when you say share screen, it usually gives you like two or three different options. You can have desktop or you can select the PowerPoint, if, if, you know, because it, it usually is a blue box about around anything that's, that's open on your, desktop that you don't want to share. Yeah. Then, yep. then, then say select that and then say share and then the rest of us will see it. It might just share the whole thing. Hmm. We'll see. It's fine. I, I do have talking points there, but and I might miss a few points, but it's fine. Um, do you see my screen there? We do. We see the PowerPoint. Okay. Yep. Nice, nice. And what am I doing? Let's go to it's been such a long time since I used PowerPoint, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> uh, I'm going, where's the view? Oh, it's over. It's covering the, um, it's covering the, there we go. That's where it is. Okay, let's play from the beginning. Okay, cool, cool. All right. Um, so, I mean, first off, this is a, just a few things that I've learned is that before you even make the movie, you kind of want to think about who the film is for. Um, you got to think about your target audience. Because if you just make the film and you just, okay, I want to just make it, you have to like kind of have proof of concepts that are already out there. Like I know it's like 
this like like something in it should give you kind of like Hunger Games vibes a little bit. It's like it should kind of have you know th that kind of feel to it. So you can kind of steer it in the direction of what kind of movie you you or you steer your marketing in the direction of what kind of marketing worked for you know whatever movie. Um, so you got to ask yourself what's the target audience and. Uh, and these are my biggest pain points that I had when producing The Brotherhood, was that like, I wasn't even focused on After I Was Finished. I wasn't really focused on the music and the VFX and the ADR and the, and the sound mixing and how to make a movie poster. And e even during the production process, like how to, how to, you know, like how to find the certain locations that you're gonna be filming at. All of these things I kind of had to learn through trial, <laughs> through trial and error. Um, and on the, on the next page, we're going to get to like a few resources that'll answer some of these questions. And by the end of the PowerPoint, you're going to, all of these questions are going to be answered. Um, and you know, how do I market my film to get it seen? Um, and how in the world do I get on IMDb? Like that's like, <laughs> that's one of the big things that I wanted to know um, how to do. So, um, and also how am I going to get it on Netflix and Netflix and Amazon and iTunes and stuff like that. Um, so let's move on. There we go. Um, so, okay, so I'm sure you guys, do you guys see yourselves on the screen too? <laughs> well, yeah, we just see you and um, the PowerPoint. Oh, perfect. Okay, call it cool. Um, so the first point is obviously you got to write, you got to write the screenplay. Um, and the thing is, is that the Brotherhood, uh, Professor Williams, the Brotherhood was a fit, was like, at first it was 150 pages. Um, Okay. It was <laughs> so like my biggest advice is to write a feasible screenplay, something that it's doable, something that you can just like, you know, just something that has like minimal locations. I obviously did not listen to that advice when I made it. That's why it took me so long. Um, there's probably about just off the top of my head, like 10 different locations shot, shot across different cities in this movie. <laughs> Like, I, I was shooting in Mount Holly, New Jersey for episodes four and five, Ray Street Pier, uh, Philadelphia for, you know, the uh, Boathouse Row, Philadelphia. Um, there was Upper Darby. Um, there was, uh, I did shot extensions in Virginia, which is where, I, where you saw a lot of the beautiful mountain ranges. Uh, okay. I, went, I went out in Virginia <laughs> to shoot those. <laughs> so it just kind of took me all over the place. That's why, I why, that's why it took me so long. So when you're writing it, just please try to, just bear in mind, I have to shoot all this if you're an indie filmmaker, you know, um, because that was just a nightmare. Um, there's film school and, and then th there was reality that I learned in my, th that I learned in my um, screenwriting classes. And um, I forgot who, um, who I had for my first screenwriting class, but he was essentially saying, you know, don't worry about it. Don't worry about, just, just put your imagination on the page, just get everything down and things like that. And I followed that to the T. That's why it was 150 pages. Um, but there is reality. And you have limitations, you know, based on your budget, you know, based on, you know, how many people you can hire or bring on on the project. So you, you got to make it feasible. Um, and and, and I, I'll just break in. I, I would say that that is true in the sense that if you're aiming for Warner Brothers or Marvel or somebody like that, then let your creativity flow. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And if... then, uh, as I would always say, always say as an example, if my version of the Titanic was going to be put on the screen, mm -hmm. that I couldn't have any shots of the full boat because I don't have the full boat. Right. <laughs> exactly. You know, I, you know, I would basically have a few people dressed in period clothes going up a gangplank. And then the rest of the movie would have to take place in the cabin, mm -hmm. right? You would ah. never see the ballroom or the big, you know, dining areas. And then you know the ship is sinking when you look out the porthole and you see the water creeping up on the outside of the porthole and you see water coming onto the door. That lets you know the ship is sinking. But there's no way I could do what James Cameron did. And that's a beautiful what you're talking about, Professor Williams. That's like, that, that's making you like a more creative like being like having a smaller budget kind of forces you to look at it that the story from a completely different angle right. and <laughs> you know and do things and, that you and, can and, do and, and the thing i think you did do you know you didn't have the budget to show 
you know, the evil government right. and all of their facilities. And, and so you basically had to make believable as much as you could with what you could actually sell. So, right. You know, and, and so that is the other thing I think that's important for all of us to, to, to gain from your experience. So I'll shut up and you continue. Sir. Yeah, no, for, for sure. Thank you. I, I love the way you chime in. It's more of a conversation that way. I love it. Um, so, so the thing is, is that when your creative juices are flowing at the same time, it is harder to like put a cap on what you're creating because even when I knew I was going to create everything myself, I still had planes exploding. Um, I had jets shooting at the ground. I had like, I had so many, <laughs> I had so many not feasible things in the screenplay. So I just cut that down. So yeah, I still went over that, blah, 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 reevaluate, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, I was forced to reevaluate the whole thing and cut 64 pages out so that it could be the 86 minute runtime film that you guys saw. And uh, it made it a lot more, you know, succinct. It made it to the point so that like everything that you kind of heard was kind of crucial and kind of came back at the end. And it's like, oh crap, oh, that guy's not good. And that guy was like, what's, what's going on? Did, did, did you see that twist coming by the way, Professor Williams? Did you see it coming? I'm just curious. Which one? The, 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 the uh, Sloan, the Sloan twist. Uh, you know, I, it, it, there was one moment that you all had, I don't know if it was an episode or two before we find out who he really is, where he got shot or something, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I said, okay, well, these guys are tight, because I wasn't sure, you know, who he was, and, and you know, because it, it wasn't kind of clear who was who out there in the woods. Right. But uh, as, as, as your intel guy was kind of like, you know, looking at all the things on his screen, he started to say, ah... Uh, you know what? Somebody out here is dirty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Oh man, so cool, cool. Yeah, th that was just like uh, that was something pretty interesting that I, you know, th that I thought like like I was writing it like I didn't actually see that coming when I first wrote it, and I was like, ooh, that would okay. be a great twist, and I just re-engineered it backward. You know what I mean? And I just was like, because I mean. W w while I was writing it, that is. Um, gotcha. So, yeah, like I mentioned before, um, when writing the screenplay, invaluable resources, Robert McKee's story, this is a great book to recommend. A great book. If you go into a screenwriting class, this is the first thing they're going to, Robert McKee's story, or it's going to be this guy, <laughs> Save the Cat by Blake Snyder. And this gives you, you know, the beat sheets. This gives you, you know, your log line, your one sentence summary that's supposed to basically steer your entire screenplay. Um, and Robert McKee's story, this gives you the, you know, this goes into it a lot more depth. I call this like the Bible of screenwriting, in my opinion, <laughs> because he goes into depth about everything, scene structure, act structure, technique, how you should write dialogue a little bit. And he also created another book on dialogue called Dialogue. Um, but yeah, like, uh, so highly recommend those three books if you wanted to, you know, write your own, write your own film. Now, did you ever see, uh, the film Adaptation? I haven't seen Adaptation, but I heard it was incredible. Right. And, and, uh, Brian Cox actually plays Robert McKee in one scene. He's really? Kind of like, uh, he's kind of like, um. The opening of Glengarry Glen Ross, oh. uh, where Alec Baldwin is. Got to get the leads. Got to get those leads. Yeah, yeah, yeah the Glengarry leads. He, so he, so so uh, so, the character goes to one of his presentations and he says, "Well, nothing happens in the world. Nothing happens to my character. Just mm -hmm. nothing happens." And and then Robert McKee just launches his tirade on him. Mm. That I mean. In my even in my three three one course, I basically had been able to play that mm. that scene because, like, you know, why am I wasting two hours? Why are you wasting my two hours? You know, just watch your movie. If nothing happens in it, right? You know, so so that that part of, of adaptation really kind of forced uh, uh, the character to to dig deep into his real story because he was just kind of like drifting off here, drifting off there. And of course, that's a real screenwriter writing about screenwriting. Damn, so, yeah. Um, as, as you got your script done, then how, how did you end up raising the money for this? How, how were you able to, to, to put the pieces together financially? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Yeah, so basically I, was, I saved my coins. I saved my money. I worked and I saved 
I saved the fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to 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 basically fundraise it myself. But it was, mind you, I had four years, right? So like, I would not recommend it to you. I would recommend that you guys go on places like film.org. And so, no matter what state you're living in, there are various resources that you can draw upon. You just if film.org is Phillies. Um, but if you Google your state and then film office, that'll basically give you the film office uh, that'll, you know, that'll essentially have all of the resources, all of the grants that you can apply for, and all of the, you know, you, you could get money that way. And that was the way I'd recommend. Um, but I was just, you know, I just wanted to, I, I, I didn't, I don't know, I, I just, well, the truth is that I didn't even know that you could get grants when I was making it. I didn't know that those options were available. So I'm like, Dang, filmmaking, this filmmaking thing is expensive. So like I saved all my money and I spent fifteen to twenty thousand dollars on this film, uh, basically in between the five years that I made it. Um, okay. okay. So I know that's not a good answer that you guys are looking for. But hey, it's you know, these these people are all gonna have to scratch scratch the money from somewhere because uh, the economy that we're in now, yeah. you're going to find even fewer people ready to stick their neck out uh, than you would have with, you know, everybody was happy and fat and, and going to the restaurant every day and going to play golf. I mean, it's going to be a little bit harder to, uh, to, to eat that out. Exactly. But again, all the guerrilla tactics that, that you that have worked for you, we need to know about. Oh, yeah. I'm, 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 and I'm going to be going through a lot of them. <laughs> I'm going to be going okay. through them. Um, starting with, so let's say you need a cast and crew, right? So let's start with cast, right? Um, so first off, you want to make sure that you have two people in mind for each and every role, like you're doing a play. Uh, don't you know with plays like they have alternates? You know, <laughs> they always, you think about that with your indie feature film. Um, because you never know who's going to drop out early. You never know what, and also you're going to have to rewrite things while you're even in the darn production process. You're going to have to write people out. Um, the, the character Carlos, he was supposed to be in episode four and five. Um, and he was supposed to actually be a death at the end of episode four. So it was okay. like, boom, boom. It was supposed to be kind of that, that like emotional hook that's like, oh, no, no, you know. And it's like, you know, so, um, but anyway, th those are the people, like, the, th there are ways to get cast, um, without paying them, right? Um, one thing that I recommend all of you guys to do, even though you're not actors or any, I don't know how many of you guys are actors or not, take an acting class. Um, I would recommend that because you can build relationships and build like meaningful connections with those people and you can you know, get a chance to, to show them your work and show them what, what you're made of and stuff like that so that they have, uh, so that they can you know, be willing to work with you for free. And if they're your friends, they work for you for free. <laughs> I, built, I built three years, I, I knew the actors for three years before I asked them all to be in the Brotherhood. So all the actors you see in the Brotherhood are Actor Center friends from Philadelphia. They're all, uh, they're, they're all right. friends from the Actor Center. They're all professional working actors <laughs> who I took classes with. And I'm like, hey, I got this project working on. So all you have to do is instill the confidence in them that you're going to give them something that they you know, believe is worthwhile. Um, so that's why you don't have to pay them. But you have to give them something, right? And they want a reel. They want footage. If you can give them footage, they will do a lot for you. If you can give them clean, crystal clear, beautiful 4K, you know, HD footage that will look, you know, fantastic for their reel. That's what they want. Um, and that's super important. Uh, so what else I got here? Um, and yeah, yeah, I told it. So like uh, there's this one story I wanted to tell about like why you need alternates. So there's someone who I really trusted and thought that he was going to be on board with the project. And um, right before production started, he's like, oh man, I'm sorry, I have to go to Africa. And I was like, Africa? You didn't, you didn't say you had to be in Africa like two weeks ago. <laughs> so I had, to replace his, I had to replace his behind quick, quickly, very quick. Um, so you kind of have to always have the mindset of things are never going to go according to plan, like ever. Um, 
So that's another thing. Um, and also, I wanted to circle back to film.org and when you Google your state and then film office, you can find right. tons of resources on there. You can find location resources, you can find crew resources and grants, like I said before. Um, you can find like tons of, tons of artists on there, makeup artists and people who you'll need um, on there. And you can kind of work with them and work with their budget you know, and say, hey, I've done this in the past. I've done this short in the past. Look how beautiful it is. Look how clean it is. Look how it sounds. And then you can kind of use that as kind of like a marketing tool for yourself to get them to work for you, either for free or for a lower cost. You know, it's a lot easier if they're friends with you, right? If you're friends, well, why didn't I knew each other for years? <laughs> so that's why it was easy. Hey, Wyatt, help me with this. I'm like, oh, sure, okay, fine. You know what I mean? Um, so like, it's all about relationships. And if you can build meaningful relationships with people in, in the industry, then that's, that's, that, that's, that's how you do it. That's so, that's like w one of the keys. And if you're making your first feature film, one of my biggest advice to you guys is to try to get two people who are like your heart throughout the whole project. You kind of want two cheerleaders um, <laughs> who kind of gets you, gets you up when you're down and you know, like people who like motivate you to, to just do it and go out there and do the best job that you can because this is, it's gonna be hard. And you're gonna, this, this, my worst times comes when I'm you know, in the bathroom, on the toilet, just saying. I'm just sitting down and I'm thinking and I'm just like, this film is not gonna be successful. That's when my demons attack me. When I'm, when I'm, when I'm just by myself, I'm like, your film is not gonna be successful. No one's gonna watch it. You're not gonna get it distributed. You're not gonna have enough money to do that. You're not gonna, and, but you need someone to kinda, you know, that's what, at least what I needed and that's what I, you know, recommend. Um, so the next thing is, oh, um, one last thing about location is that um, there's a lot of different guerrilla tactics that you can use, right? Um, so you can reach out to the people who have the location and like, you know, you can go on fi film, you know, film.org and find those, find those different locations. You have to make a lot of phone calls to find out what the protocol is, find out you know, what permits you'll need and things like that. And when, and when you, let's, let's say you shoot in the forest, like Fairmount Park. Let's say you shoot in the forest with Fairmont Park in, in PA. Um, you'll need to hire park rangers right. there. And I'm like, park rangers? And then they're like, oh, are you going to be using those guns? OK, you'll need film insurance. I'm like, Fil insurance? Yep. Insure insu insu what? I was like confused. I was like, why, is, why do I need all these things? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> but there is a guerrilla tactic to get around that. So like, for me, I felt like I hit a brick wall. Like, and I couldn't, because the money that you need, you need the money, those people are like $150 a day. And they're not even in the darn movie, park rangers. <laughs> they're not right. even, you know, you gotta pay them to be there. And film insurance, or, you know, I, when I looked at it, it was like $1,500 or $5,000, and it was like the indie, indie film package or whatever. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a nightmare. Um, so what I did, is what I called, I went through my phone book, I called people around and I said, hey, do you know anybody with land? <laughs> I'm not kidding. You call people, sure, you sure. ask them if you have land, and I'm not even kidding. My dad, months into the, my dad came out of the woodwork and said, hey, one of my coworkers has about like eight acres of land in Mount Holly, New Jersey. I was like, that's gonna work. That's gonna work, you know? And so that's where episodes four and five was. That was the Mount Cairo that you, that you saw. Gotcha. And that was more than enough space. We had, we had so much room to like breathe and be separate. This is like the perfect Corona location because you can just be socially distant. It's outside. Um, so yeah. Uh, so that was that. Uh, that's the guerrilla tactic. I highly recommend it. You you won't need permits, you know, because you, you're kind of you, you, you won't because it's private land, right. um, Absolutely. and it's someone who you know. So that's a workaround. Um, but when you approach it without like knowing, you'll just think that it's a brick wall. And there's going to be way more brick walls that I'm going to mention later on um, during your production process. You're going to want 
a film production like binder. Uh, this was mine's for the Brotherhood. Things that you have like, um, you know, like actor releases, actor release forms to, you know, have them, have them in there. Um, I had like, uh, Professor Williams is probably gonna laugh at my makeshift uh, master shot list. This is like one day for the master shot list. Basically what I have on here is like, I have like time, time up here. I, you know, put a reminder to, you know, bring lunch and bring your lunches. Um, how many pages we're shooting for that day. Um, what characters are required for that day. Uh, what makeup is required for that day. What equipment is required for that day. And each and every time I have the time that we shoot what we're shooting. Like let's say right. 11.05 to, to 11.20, right? We're gonna shoot, um, it's, we're gonna shoot, <laughs> this is just how I did it, Professor. So it's, it's, uh, it's page three, close up, uh, page three, close up, camera on this, blah, blah, blah. Um, tripod, it's a stable shot. Uh, trees, trees is just like the location, uh, the, the, the location area. Um, like, uh, it was like the, the subset of where we were. And then we have Aiden, I put like left screen, like Aiden left screen listens to, listens to line that's being given from Eli and Otis blurred RS, right side of the screen. So like in my brain, you'd, so you'd ideally want like an, an actual, you know, storyboard, <laughs> ideally. Um, but if you don't have the time and if you can visualize things just by writing them with words each and every shot, that's what my master shot list is. Before I went on set, I made a list of every single shot that I had to shoot ever in the whole film so that I know I'm just crossing things off when I get there, just crossing things off. So I want to turn my brain on autopilot as, as much as possible when I go on set because when you start thinking, that's when you start to lose daylight, that's when the sun goes down, and then you have to wait until the day after to get the same shot that you're trying to get. Um, so. so, Alan, we are almost halfway through uh, your presentation, and yeah. since this class is really focused on the business of show, all of these tips are going to help anybody who has to put together their own independent project right because all projects whether you have 200 million or whether you have 20 cents in your budget is about problem solving yeah so the, the part of your journey we're really really dying to hear about is okay so now you have a finished product right and so now go you've got to get it distributed somewhere you've got to either get it shown on the big screen or you've got to get an aggregator or a streamer interested in it. Yeah, so absolutely. What was, that, what was that part of the journey like for you? So um, I got post-production, but I'm going to skip that part. So here we go. Um, Distriber was a film aggregator. I, 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 do, do, do they know who, what a film aggregator is? Yes, they do. Okay, cool, cool. So Distriber was a film aggregator that I used, and that was like one of the most popular film aggregators for indie filmmakers at the time that I used at Distriber. I don't know if you've heard of them, Professor Williams, but there was this massive scandal. So I was one of their last clients. Um, so I think you guys can learn from this. Um, I paid them, how their business model worked is that I paid them $1,600 um, to uh, basically get my, you know, get my film on their, you know, on their, on, in, their, in their funnel so that they can then um, you know, get it through to iTunes and Amazon. Right. And you had to pay per platform. You had to pay to get it on there. I think it was like an additional like $250 each platform. Well, um, first of all, you had to pay their, their fee, their $1,600, just to be, like you say, in their funnel. Just Exactly. Of, one of the films that they're, they're then going to generate business for, then they successfully sign you to a platform, and that's the, an additional $250 from you. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So right. that was, <laughs> and I'll tell you why it's a nightmare. <laughs> Because what happened in the end, it will, will, will kick you. It'll kick you in the face, and it kicked me in the face. Um, so 
I finished, you know, because there are sta there's quality standards that you need to meet that they will send you. You, know, you need to have a trailer. You need to have, uh, you know, poster, uh, three kinds of different posters and three kinds of different formats. Um, you need captions. If not, they'll charge you a caption fee. They'll upcharge you for a caption fee. In other words, your, your whole movie has already had closed captions. Exactly. Okay, gotcha. So it has to have closed captions. And what there are caption websites that you can just go on and you can pay them like maybe like 100 bucks and get all that get all the captions for your film done. And if they do it wrong, then you can just go in there and edit it and then send it back to them and say, hey, I'm going to edit these, and, you know, edit the SRT file, I believe. Um, and just like, you, you can just use that for your film. But anyway, Distribber. So what happened was um, I had it on iTunes and Amazon. And I think the first month um, on iTunes and Amazon, the Brotherhood did like $500 because I sold it for like, uh, I had it for five dollars, and I think I had it. No, no, no. I had it for twelve ninety nine. Actually, had it for twelve ninety nine. Okay. And I had like I reached out to a lot of people. I, you know, I was like, hey, I got this movie out. Blah blah blah. I put you know stuff on my YouTube channel, stuff on Instagram, and stuff everywhere. And you know, five hundred dollars worth of sales. And what happened? At the end, they were going bankrupt. And so guess what happened to my $1,600 plus my $500 in sales? Went to the bankruptcy attorneys, huh? Completely gone. Completely gone. So I was in a fight with Distribber trying to get my films removed off those platforms because if it's not removed off those platforms by that film aggregator, the film aggregator is going to be making money off of your film eternally off of that platform right. Right. because you can't have the same content on the platform twice. you are like, no, 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 but, but, but I'm the filmmaker. No, 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 no. The film's already on there. <laughs> so I was in an argument with the distributor trying to get my film away from, you know, off of iTunes and Amazon because, so one thing about um, Amazon, for instance, and Tubi TV, for instance, both Amazon and Tubi TV, you can put your film on there without a film aggregator. Good to know. Um, okay. So I would recommend exhausting your options, going through as many of those platforms as possible, trying to get your film on there by yourself so that you take the profits immediately after it's watched. That it's just you to them. It, it simplifies the process completely because if not, the money's going to go to the film aggregator first. And then whatever the film aggregator feels like giving you, they'll give you what's left of, you know, the, or, or, or what, you know, what they say they're going to give you according to their fee structure. Um, and, and, that's, and we discussed a little bit of that from the traditional film world before you came on, and that if you were in the legacy theater market, you would put your film through. We just finished looking at some box office charts right. uh, for this particular weekend that passed. And so you have a gross number, which is how many people actually bought tickets. Right. But then right after that, there's a split between yeah. how much the theater actually keeps of that revenue mm -hmm. and the distributor gets. So in this, in this market, it's probably 50-50. Yeah. So 50, 50 cents of every dollar stayed at the theater, and the other 50 cents goes to the distributor. Mm -hmm. They normally would take 30% off the top as a fee, yeah. and they would charge you expenses which in the legacy world would be prints and advertising and then if there's anything left you might see something trickle into your pocket so <laughs> what, what 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 are the what is the, what are the fees that you're being charged if you go say directly to amazon that's a great question you're working with a distributor a distributor or an aggregator so As you mentioned there's a fee just to be part of them mm -hmm. part of aggregators you know funnel or network then there's a fee for each platform. So not, now that you, not you for Film Hub, Amazon, though. What's, what does what is, what is the fee structure look like there? Not for Film Hub. For Film Hub, there is okay. no entry fee. So they just take a part of what your film makes. That's why they're like trending as the number one film distribution platform for like um, indie filmmakers. They're free like free, quote unquote free, right? Um, so they just make whatever, when, when your film makes money, they make money. So I believe the okay. split is 
with them. But okay. you can go check on their website just to double check. But if you went straight to Amazon, Bezos is what I, I call Bezos a pirate. Because <laughs> he takes 50% of sales. Okay. 50%. John Amazon takes, <laughs> Amazon takes 50%, which is like, holy crap. iTunes is different. iTunes 70-30 split. So okay. 70 in your favor, 30% goes to iTunes. But mind you, I never got to see that money because iTunes, you need a film aggregator to go through to get to iTunes, right? So okay. different platforms, you need film aggregators to actually get to. Um, like, for instance, Netflix is a huge one. Uh, Hulu is a big one. And let's say, you're ta let's say you want to get into Netflix or Hulu, right? Um, so that's that, but I wanted to get to this. If you wanted to get your film into Netflix, it has to be filmed on pre-approved cameras, right? And this is the camera I'd recommend to, you see me pointing at it, <laughs> to indie filmmakers. It's the Panasonic S1H, and I assure you, it is one of the cheapest cameras on their list. And it yeah, shoots 4096 by 2160 in precious, beautiful 4K, Cinema 4K, with 400 megabits per second. You get beautiful image quality. And I believe the camera is only like $3,000. Some of you might be like, ugh, 3000 but like the other cameras are, I assure you, like much, much worse. Uh, much, much, much more expensive. Um, so you have like the filmmaker, and then you typically go through the film aggregator. Uh, like you, you know, you talk to Film Hub, for instance, and then you can get your, you know, you, you you submit all your materials to them. Then you can get your film, let's say, on iTunes. But Amazon, you can do it by yourself. Netflix and Hulu, you need to prove the product in the market before you go to Netflix and Hulu. Unless you have Will Smith in your movie, or Leonardo DiCaprio in your movie, <laughs> or, you know, or any kind of, you know, big highbrow stars, then you can just go directly to an agent and say, hey, you know, like, you, you know, you, and then they kind of make things happen magically. Um, but you need to prove the market, um, and the film aggregators will help you do that if you've sold enough units or enough, if you were, or if you have enough eyes on your work. Then you can then look at Hulu and Netflix and you know let's say you're doing fifty thousand dollars in sales you know that's yeah. gonna get Netflix's attention they're gonna be like mm, what's going on here it's, it's gonna be, you know so that's gonna get the film aggregators excited and then you go down to you know and that's how you get to your customers um, and so for instance I took the per unit sales off of the Brotherhood and I put it on Prime so the Prime structure is different so okay. obviously you get way less money, um, but if you, so the key now is, is that it kind of changes how you market the product because there's different things that I recommend for, for marketing. Um, there's this product that I have, it's called the Clover Key. It's basically a camera plate, screwdriver, and a, and a bottle opener at the same time. Uh, so it's like a thing that you put on your keychain. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, it's probably in my room or somewhere. Uh, where's, oh, here it is. Um, stand by, sorry. Um, <laughs> it's this product here. So okay. I essentially learned a valuable lesson from making this product. I went on CAD and I, you know, I made a product and then I, you know, I went to, you know, manufacture and things like that. So like that process taught me an important lesson. When I went to Facebook, you can put on ads, run ads on Facebook and Instagram and drive traffic to okay. whatever product, including films, right? And so my recommendation is when you have per unit sales, it can work well if obviously the money that you're putting into it is less, is, is, is less than the money that you're making, right? You wanna make money. Right. Um, so you can just kind of test it and test it with different markets. I think there's, some, there's something called Facebook Pixel that kind of um, tracks it tracks like what type of customer is actually doing well, is actually converting. And the more customers you convert, the more people are likely to, the, the more people are likely to, to, to buy it, right? So it's like, and so it kind of makes it easier as more sales go through that process. Um, okay. And so th th that's one thing that I recommend per unit uh, when you're doing it. You could just put on Facebook, 
Instagram, TikTok ads. Let me see if I have, let me see. Yeah, yeah, paid for ads on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Um, and that, that, if you're selling it per unit. Now, if you're not selling it per unit and it's on Amazon Prime, it's a bit tougher of a road because then you're making a few cents. So what do they, they give you a portion of the pay per click or how, how are they aggregating your revenue on Amazon you, Prime? Your revenue for Prime is, I believe, so, okay, this is going to be, this is going to hurt, this is going to hurt a lot of people. Um, so let's say, for instance, you're getting 6,000 minutes watched per month, right? Okay. Um, and that's how it's broken down on their website, by minutes watched. That'll equal to, if you're lucky, and that's between the UK, you can access two territories for free, uh, the UK and the, uh, obviously, United States of America. And so out of those two territories, and this is without marketing, like let's say your film is doing 6,000 minutes, right? Um, you're gonna make maybe like a dollar or two every month. <laughs> so it's, it's, not, it's not very lucrative without the per unit sale. And, okay. and that's, okay. why, that's why I highly recommend that you um, build your audience while you're making your movie. That's the biggest thing that I could recommend to anyone is while you're making the movie, be think behind the scenes, posting it places or having your team post it places so that you're building an email list to then convert sales later. Um, that's that, obviously that's one of the many strategies that you can use. Um, you can start a YouTube channel, start an Instagram page, you know, I think TikTok is, TikTok is popping off. TikTok is very new and it's getting, making a lot of people money, making a lot of people a lot of money. All these platforms are making a lot of people a lot of money and they're just converting their products and they're at a very rapid pace. Um, and it just depends on how big you grow your audience during the production process. Um, and so that's, as an indie filmmaker, that's what I'd recommend. Um, All right. Alan, with the time we have left, I want the students uh, to, uh, to speed date with you and get it's, some questions in. It's so crazy. That time just flew by. I didn't even get through a lot of my points, but it's, it's glad I got the important stuff that, that, that you guys needed, you know? So that's good. It's an education for sure. And, yeah. And, um, so, uh, and also we want to say, Alan, but while you're from Pennsylvania and I've got Pennsylvania in my and my, it's my virtual background here, Pennsylvania, through nice. uh, Biden over the hump. So we now no, we have, have, house. We but, have yeah. a yes, we are. Six, we have a forty-six president elect, Professor Williams. But you got to know, bad things happen in Philadelphia. So like, you can't, you, you can't. <laughs> not to me. <laughs> and not to me either. Right. Uh, like, what is he talking about? Anyway. Yeah, yeah West bad. Philly. I'm from West Philly. Hi. It's, it's bad. It, it, it's, it's bad. I'm in the area, too. If, nice. If, it, if, if it's bad, if you're planning to cheat somebody in Philly. But this this bridge, the Ben Franklin Bridge, we use as a location for some movie I did about, um, it was called The In Crowd, mm -hmm. with a writer called Mark Rosenthal, who mm. wrote Superman and some of these other action films i would say in the late 80s early 90s mm -hmm. and this was his coming back to hometown philly to shoot his own small film because he was tired of just writing and watching everybody else take his words and put them on the screen mm. and uh, i mean everybody in philly was just a joy to work with uh, the teamsters um, it took me to all the great restaurants i guess that's in south philly absolutely uh, west philly you know um, uh, just I mean, we just like we were all over town, north, south, east, west. You know, beautiful so, questions. Questions from uh, developing fiction films while we still have Alan Wade Northern on the line. How did he do it? What would he do differently? Come on, you all, because if you don't, you know, I know you're all happy about what's going to happen in January, but <laughs> it's January. We got seriously. In January. May not make. I have it. a question if I can. Get it. Get it. Um, yeah, so because um, I know you're talking about actors and you know, and, and able to like make friends with actors to help them get in your film, but I was wondering about like your your crew as well too, because mm. that's one thing. I, I come from a sound background. I'm not really that good with cinematography, and kind of what 
what your crew looked like, you know, like if it was you holding the camera or if it was like you know, three people, multiple people, and, and like how you were able to assemble your crew if it was paying people or kind of building those relationships. Yeah, so so mostly to be honest, it was mostly the, like I just relied a lot on um, those two key people who I talked to you about. You kind of want the, the people to kind of help you drive the ship. Um, and it was the people who I build relationships with. But I could tell you, though, that it's, uh, James, that it's very important to search. Uh, there's, um, there's so many different websites that you can go on to find crew, especially for post. Um, have, you, have you heard of Upwork.com, James? Um, I, oh, yeah, yeah, that's kind of like um, where you can just hire people. You can hire anybody to do anything. And, like to, to do anything, um, and also Craigslist too is another one. Um, Up, Upwork is a great resource to use for for a crew, but also um, there there are um, like for instance, let's say you're a screenwriter. Um, there are different gr like roundtables that you can have that, that that you can actually access and actually build relationships that way. You go to different film networking events that are on like film.org or you know Google what state you are and then film office then you'll see what, what networking events are around in your area and that's another way to build you know relationships in your area I know for instance I, I'm a I love writing so I go to a lot of writers roundtables and there's people who you build all organically build a connection with who can help you you know <laughs> let's say look over your script and you guys look over each other's scripts you build build connections that way um, so I'd highly recommend doing that if especially if you wanted like a a DP to kind of work for little, you know, minimum, <laughs> minimum, you know, amount of cash. Um, so, yeah, that's the um, best. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. No, go ahead. What, what is a range for a DP for shooting an in, in indie type film like like Brotherhood? What's the, what's the range to to ex expect? It depends on how much you're leaning on them. It depends because like, so, like a lot of DPs have their own equipment. And if they have, for instance, I know, <laughs> I know a DP with a, he's got like, you know, a Monstro, a red Monstro is like a massive red camera. And like, it's like they're, they're expensive. So you're going to be paying a lot of, I would, oh my gosh, to give you a range that would almost be criminal for it, for it not to be accurate, but it, it could be from anywhere from 500 to like $2,000 a day to pay them. <laughs> Over about how many days? <laughs> it depends, that's why I recommend depends. in the, in the lessons learned section uh, that I had written down here, I would recommend right, like making a short first because it, it, it's so, I don't, it, it, you could just learn so much by doing a short. Like I probably, if I were to do a do-over, I probably would have made four shorts. Like four, <laughs> in the time that I made this 86 minutes, you know, of, of the brotherhood, to be honest. Uh, like, for Professor Williams, does that sound about accurate to you? About 500 to 2,000 or it could be even more. Professor, um, he had to step away from his computer really quick. Oh, quickly. word. Then okay. He'll be back in like a minute or two. Oh, okay. Cool. 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 All right. Yeah. Would, yeah. Would we be able to ask you for the I don't know the the electrons for the slides that you weren't able to finish, particularly with your lesson? You I was gonna ask the same thing. Oh. That looked like a pretty solid PowerPoint. Oh. And I would right. Really I would like to see it again. Oh, cool. But, you know, if you wanted to share, we we won't mind, especially being from Philly and. Yeah, oh, of course. Of course. Yeah, I can I I yeah, I'll definitely send I'll, I'll send Professor Williams the I'll send Professor Williams the uh the PowerPoint for sure. Yeah. Um Alan, I wanted to know uh what what kind of drove your decision to star in your own film uh and what that experience was like for you because I know me personally I'm like a a person that like I need to have my hand on everything. <laughs> yeah, that's so, what a director. Uh, what was that experience like? You know, writing it, uh, starring in it, and that whole. Yeah, it was it was kind of like a dream come true because I was from ages eight to fourteen. You know, I, I was born and raised kind of like I, I I wanted to act. That was my that was my dream to act, and so I would from things weren't happening fast enough for me. 
When I was 14 and I was in a Dick Sporting Goods commercial, I was actually in a Dick Sporting Goods commercial at 14, which is dope. But then jobs just stopped coming. I stopped, I just, uh, auditions stopped, you know, I stopped getting as much auditions as I used to get. And so that kind of turned a switch off in my head, whereas I kind of wanted to, I wanted to be in something that, I, that, that I'm proud of because I got a lot of auditions for like gangster, thug, you know, corner selling drugs somewhere, and you know, individuals who don't know anything about writing ebonics, writing like, like or like, like, like writing broken slang or whatever. Like, like there's so many bad scripts, like or sides. Actually, you get sides as an actor that that, that you'll be exposed to. You just kind of want to write your own thing, and that's why I wanted to write my own thing. And also, I wanted the what you saw on screen to be more of an accurate representation of what the planet Earth looks like. I was tired of seeing a lot of things where you just watch something and it's just all, all, all um, one race. I'll, I'll, it's, it's all one race. It's like, nope, nope, there's no black people who exist. There's no other people who exist. So I was sure to have um, individuals who are African American, individuals who are white, individuals who are from India, individuals who are Hispanic. Like all those people were in the Brotherhood. Like all the cast, was, uh, I think it was like so diverse. And I'm like, you know, I think the, the media could take a, you know, take a page from my book because <laughs> you know, I still watch TV today and I'm like, hmm, where am I? You know, where, <laughs> you know what I mean? You're talking about like a Woody Allen movie, right? Yeah, yeah well, yeah, exactly. It's like, ah. Oh. City and I'm like, okay, so. <laughs> Where in New York is he? <laughs> that's not that's not a part of I mean in the richest part of New York all the way to the deepest, darkest slums. I'm like, it's everybody. The subway train. Mm-hmm. Yeah, black uh, stockbroker, white stockbroker, an Asian stockbroker, female stockbroker. Yeah. Black homeless person, a white homeless person, a female homeless person. All across Asian the board. Person. It's all there. So where was he in New York that he said, oh, this is a very homogenized avenue. Um, you had one question uh, about fees or costs or something, Alan, when I stepped away. Oh, yeah, yeah. There was, um, it was essentially, I, was, uh, I had a question about how much could you expect to pay a DP per day? And I was like, well, you know, if you're relying on their equipment, I said it could be from anywhere from 500 to 2,000 a day. I was going to say because you know it it's there 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 are two different uh streams or revenue streams there it's like paying the person as a director of photography which you may get to negotiate okay well I can't pay you a salary but I can rent your 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 equipment and I can give you a portion of if there are any profits later, if they go for that, then take it. Run yeah. with it. Um, if they say, no, 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 I've, I've done this deal so many times before, I need cash on the barrel head. Um, the way that you should look at that is how much would it cost you to actually go to a rental house and rent that amount of equipment that that person has? What would that cost you on a daily basis? Now, the rental houses will give you a deal as well. Yeah. But the, the thing is, you also, the word that Alan used earlier in his presentation is they're going to need you to provide insurance with that equipment. And that insurance policy is another cost that you probably didn't put in your original budget. So I'm, I'm thinking a DP for a feature quality piece, you know, low budget, but feature quality piece, you'd be looking at between 800 on the low end and, and maybe 12 to 1500 in the middle portion, mm. and then you go higher than that. Now, they may not charge you a five-day week. Maybe they charge you a three-day week or a four-day week. So they work with you, yeah. You know, it, it really depends. And then the other thing that, that Alan may have mentioned when I stepped away, that but we all had to look at each project as people working below the line, meaning we weren't the writer, director, or the producer. In this mm -hmm. particular case, we were like, department heads so we did the sound or we did camera we did costumes we did makeup we did lighting we're looking at this project as as he mentioned earlier it's like okay so what does this bring us mm -hmm. other than the money maybe there is no money but it's going to be something that we can put on our imdb 
I was part of the Brotherhood cast, and this ended up getting picked up and went on and did so forth and so on. And this launched me into like a, 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 a DP that people would call. This made my sound design something people wanted me to replicate. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as I mentioned last week, and some of you all chimed in on the chat about the aggravation fee. So you got to weigh that, okay? Uh, I, God bless John Singleton. I had many conversations with John Singleton mm. over the years, but I never worked with him. Uh, the one time we got closest, to, two times we got close to doing something together with Shaft, and his producer said he, would, he wasn't going to pay the additional money it would cost to bring L.A. sound people to New York. Um. And that's real money. I said, hey, John, you know, you call me some other time. And then the other one, I think, would have been Rosewood. And, you know, my agent said, they really want you on Rosewood. And I said, well, how much is, you know, I said, well, how much do they want me? Which is code for, <laughs> you know, what are we talking about here? Yeah. Dollars, this, and, and she said, scale. And I said, mm, I'm not, I'm not going to dodge snakes for, I don't know, six or seven weeks of nights in the swamp for scale. I could get work in L.A. for scale on a five-day weekend ride my beam or back and forth to, to work and the only snakes I have to worry about are the ones that have expensive shoes on <laughs> crocodile <laughs> right I know right. that's I mean, right we're talking about real snakes you know where they were shooting in, in Florida or Georgia or whatnot so um, so I was working on a TV series where the star co-star wanted me to do sound on her directorial debut and and so she had the grip electric crew already working for her. and they were doing it for free but see on a television show they were working a five day a week i was only working two days out of the week when we actually shot mm. so she was expecting me to give her that deal i said no 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 you're going to pay me i'll give you 1200 you know a day for the weekend it's like but 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 i said yeah but 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 what i said when i'm at, at warner brothers i'm using warner brothers gear i don't have to put that in a van and take mm -hmm. it anywhere when I'm doing your piece. I've got to put my stuff in a band. I've got to cover the insurance because you're not covering that. I got yeah. to, so, and, and she said, well, that, that's a little steep. And I said, I said, look, trust me, you would pay twice that for a leather bag. Yeah. Four or five times that. So now is the leather bag more important in your career as a director or you need good sound? Well, I'll see what I can do with someone else. Yeah. Cool. Because you know what? The aggravation factor is like, I'm going to stay home and play tennis. I wasn't playing golf back then. So, I, you know, I, money in my pocket, time on my hands. Because at a certain point, the time is actually even more precious than the money. Yeah. You know, so when you're Alan's age, like I wasn't, when I was Alan's age and younger, it's like a 22-hour day, call me. Right. Because I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to move up. You know, mm -hmm. I'm trying to get there. You know, after I got there, I was like, told my agent, now, if it was going to be like 12 years a slave, and I knew that this thing was going to be an Oscar contender, okay, and I'm going to work with, you know, Steve McQueen, because I had never worked, you know, by the time he came along, I was already back here teaching. I said, okay, let's see what, let's see what, let's see what they're talking about. The other way of negotiating is forget the money. Okay, I'm union, so I'm going to get scale. Scale is fine. Give me more perquisites. What does that mean? Okay, bigger hotel room. All right. Mm -hmm. If the DP is getting a thousand dollars a day per diem, then I want favored nations. If the DP is only getting five hundred a day is per diem, I'll take five hundred a day per diem. If the DP is riding first class, flying first class, then I'll take favored nations. I'll take, you know, I'll put me in the front of the plane. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that way. It's not setting a precedent where I earned all this money from salary, but they can give me perks. They can give me, you know, bigger car, better room, you know. So that's the sort of thing that makes working on set more comfortable if you have a better, a better place to actually lay your head and get some real sleep mm -hmm. and get a real meal and have a real vehicle the day one day you do get off to go out and take a road trip, you can do that. Yeah. So, any last questions before I let Mr. Uh, Alan Wade slash Aiden <laughs> uh, go back to his Saturday life 
I wanted to I wanted to make one more point though with Where's respect to with, with respect to indie filmmakers and it kind of piggybacks off of what what you were talking about Professor Williams is that if your budget's super 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 low IMDb credit might be enough for some for someone who hasn't you know it might be enough they have no credits right um, so that speak back to to James's point um, and how you do that is you submit to various film festivals and those film festivals basically put they help you get that on IMDb um, that's how the Brotherhood got on IMDb is because I submitted to Slam Dance and I submitted to a lot of a uh, lot of different you know Sundance and I submitted to a lot of different film festivals and they kind of recognized it as a film so you got to prove that it's real <laughs> and then and then they put it on IMDb that's how I got it on IMDb um, and also talking about covering your equipment too if you're like an indie filmmaker and you have like a Panasonic GH5 or a Panasonic SH1 and stuff like that or S1H you can get a personal articles policy to cover all of your equipment so that if anything is broken or lost or stolen the insurance company pays you that's one thing I would recommend to every filmmaker here if you make films get a business insurance policy or a personal article insurance policy from you can talk to State Farm or whatever Geico or, or you know uh, whatever insurance company you want to talk to cover your behind because thirteen thousand dollars of my film equipment was stolen they broke into my car and they stole my camera it was underneath my seat they stole my camera bag and everything the brotherhood everything all my drives lenses cameras every gone <laughs> finished so like you just never know what's going to happen um, and if, if, if you work for a company yeah has their own insurance policy for production and but and you're bringing say for instance if alan was hired on say in, on in shark fin productions which is my you know fictitious uh film production company that i use when they're pitching to me mm -hmm. so shark fin is doing a piece and i have a production insurance policy which is generally one million or two million dollars to cover everything mm -hmm. then job is to go to the unit manager or producer and get a piece of paper to fill out that makes you the loss payee mm -hmm. on my insurance uh, on the production insurance i'll write that in the in the chat mm. so say for instance i'm working for paramount yeah i have my own production insurance which i would keep if once they give me a, my gear back and I've got to drive it back to the storage space and somebody hits me in the middle of Figueroa and, and, and Third, mm -hmm. okay, that comes off of my insurance. But while it's on Paramount's trucks or Paramount is flying it to Florida or wherever, anything happens to it while I'm working for Paramount, it's on their insurance policy, but only if I started the production as a loss payee. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, it would have been sound as ready. With living space productions is a loss payee, and then they'd have itemized lists of the stuff that you have that Paramount is leasing, and there's a check in the mail, and you're going shopping. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear a round of applause for my former student and now uh, adjunct professor as of today. <laughs> Appreciate it, guys. Thank you and, so and much. Next time I see you, man, you got to show me some of those moves, man. I had no idea I was dealing with martial artists. I just thought he was a nice guy that was really passionate about film. I didn't know you were out there, you know, making the moves. Slaying man. folks. You know, I see the sun's, the sun's out, so the guns are out. I didn't know, I didn't know that part about you. Oh, I appreciate it, Professor Williams. Yeah, I wanted to thank you all for listening. And uh, I don't know who said thank you. Uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. It's a it's a pleasure to talk to you guys. And any and anything I can do to professor for Professor Williams, I I just do it. I just I do it if it's feasible. I do it if I you know. I do. Hey, look, we've been, we've been joining the hip joining the hip since 2012, man. Ooh, for I'm sure. So proud of, of you, and I know you're gonna do a lot more. And I'm not. Experience. The other thing I love about this is the learning experience that each one of us have individually when we share it. Mm -hmm. Then we know, okay, uh, uh there's a landmine right there. Oh, yeah. Tripwire, tripwire. You know, when we all go in thinking, oh, look, I already know everything there is about the business. I don't need any help. That's how you end up uh, getting back door. And every single day I learn something new about the film business. Every, every single day. day. 
Today I learned something new just listening to Professor Williams. <laughs> Every, you, you'll always learn something new from Professor Williams. Yeah, so, I bet I have some stories to tell. Of so, course. Uh, send me the link to the to the presentation. I'll make sure I share it on Blackboard with the students. Absolutely. Uh, I'm getting ready to convert this to an MP4 so I can send this to you. Oh, thank you. And everybody in my class will reconvene at uh, 1240. Mm hmm. So you all can stretch your legs, get some chow, go yell at the TV, but come back to me at 1240 so we can get a little little bit more content in before the pitches begin awesome. at 1 o'clock. And you guys are very welcome. I see all the thank yous. You guys are very welcome. It's a pleasure talking to you guys.